Good morning and welcome to Stony Creek United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Michael and I am so grateful that you were able to join us this morning. For those of you who are joining us via our drive and if we could get one or two car honks so we know you can hear us okay. Awesome, thank you so much. And uh, for those of you joining us via Facebook Live, welcome to you and as well to those who will be listening to this over the phone uh, later this afternoon or throughout the week. Um, we have some announcements, so I'm going to turn it over to Barb, our liturgist for this morning, and she's going to tell you all kinds of fun stuff. Well, good morning on this glorious day. What a beautiful day to worship Christ. Oh, yeah, I have got so many things. Okay, Bob Hall is requesting ushers for June, July, and August. I'm sure he has a sign-up sheet, so... Get your little John Hancock on there. There is Dave Munson would like to share that the Bible study, Invitation to the Psalms, will begin on June 8th at 10 o'clock. So I know that he would love to see you. We've been, um, I found out one thing. Um, do not put Sarah Vollmer and myself on a computer, on the phone, or in person, face to face with each other, because we turn into two little hamsters on an exercise circle, just running and running and running and running. Um, good, good things are coming, just batting down the hatches. We have on the, I'll back up, the playset has arrived, it is stored in the shed, and we are going to have a playset build day on June 12th at 9 30. I realize, we all realize that it's a busy time of the year, graduations, memorial services, uh, weddings, but if you could just come on out and help us get this up, it's going to be a new part of our Christian, outdoor Christian ministry for the young people. We've had a number of young families approach us saying they would love to come over and do um, some Wednesdays during the summer. We have got uh, from 9.30 to 11.30. Oh, I have to do my prop. For those of you that are on Facebook, okay. These are my superhero sunglasses because we are doing Wednesdays starting on June, took them off, June 23rd from 9.30 to 11.30. Hopefully the place that will be up and going our first one is going to be the Pirate Academy. We will have activities, fun things for the kids to do, do a little bit of um, outreach ministry with the children. It's just an exciting time. And I, it, you all know, I am not above begging, borrowing, groveling. I can't get down on my knees anymore because I would if I could. But anyway, please, please, please come out and help us on June 12th. We'll feed you. All Methodists like food. Uh, we'll feed you. We'll try and get this thing erected. And then the kids will be able to have some time to play during the summer. <sighs> I think I've got, I think so. I think I'm through. <laughs> and um, on, a, on a serious note, let us not forget about this weekend that we need to remember our fallen veterans people who fought to help us keep our freedom that we are blessed to have. Absolutely. Um, and with that uh, place set in that, that new ministry, um, we're also creating a, more space for community to happen. Um, and that is, I think, directly in uh, connection with this church's mission statement and, and values and goals. So. Um, I'm really excited to see that progressing, and um, I think it's going to have a really good impact in a lot of different ways. Um, and it also will give our Sunday school and nursery people, uh, when we have those things again, uh, a place when it's nice out weather-wise to send the children out if they're bouncing off the walls in the room, because um, kids do that sometimes. I know mine do. Um, and it is Trinity Sunday today, the first Sunday after Pentecost. So um, if you didn't know that, you do now. And I think we are ready to worship. All righty, here we go. 
Let us start by our call to worship. Blessed be God, eternal majesty. Living Living word, word, abiding spirit. spirit. Glory to God forever. Jesus Jesus said the the way way to see God's dream for the the world world is to be born from above by the spirit. The way to to take take part part in that that dream, dream, says says Jesus, Jesus, is to be born of water and spirit. That gift gift is is available available this day. May you receive God's spirit he made whole. And and dwell dwell more deeply deeply in in love love divine. divine. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn is Father, I Adore You, and it's printed in your bulletin. Um, let's begin. We, you can read with me. Um, well, <laughs> oh, I only had one cup of coffee this morning. Bear with me. <sighs> Holy God, God source, source of, of all goodness, goodness you gave, gave your, your son for the life of the world and sent your spirit that, that your love might abide within us. Teach Teach us us how to to love each other this day, that that we may have life and have it abundantly with you in Christ and through through the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our next hymn will will be Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
Please join me in our prayer for illumination. Come, Holy Spirit, giver of life, breathe into us that we may hear a word of truth this day. Draw us into communion. Enable us to love. Conspire to make us one with you for the world you so deeply love. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, a vision of God in the temple. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that all who love him may have life eternally. With loving hearts, let us bring our offerings to God.
Holy God, your love overflows in the gifts of your spirit. Bless these gifts that we offer that they may spread your blessing in a world of hurt and need. In Christ's name, amen. As Barb uh, mentioned, it is uh, the weekend of Memorial Day, and there are varying feelings um, throughout every denomination about how we recognize uh, or if we recognize uh, those moments in our worship services. And while I do not personally care for war, nor do I believe most people do, um, I do believe it is appropriate that we acknowledge those who have given their lives not only for our freedom in this country, but for the freedoms of other countries as well. Um, you know, World War I, World War II, we weren't fighting just for our freedoms, but for the freedoms of many other countries in Europe. So I, uh, I would like just to take a moment and ask that you you have someone who has served and gone on to God's glory, that you lift their name aloud, that you hold them in your heart. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. Holy God, in this moment we give thanks and lift up all of the men and women who have served in our military and armed forces and have gone on to glory. Those who gave their life during conflict as well as those who returned home, but have now gone home to you. 
We thank you for their sacrifice. We thank you for their willingness to defend freedom. We thank you that we are able to be here today to acknowledge all of their work. And we also admit that that work is potentially beyond some of our understanding. The things that they may have been witness to, the things they may have had to do to keep themselves safe as well as to secure our freedom. God, we ask that you watch over them. We ask that you watch over all of those who continue to serve in our armed forces and those who have served and are now home here. God, we thank you for the freedoms we enjoy. And we thank you for your guiding spirit in this world. In your name we pray. Amen. If you would join me in a continued attitude of prayer. Let us offer our prayers crying, Abba, Father, knowing that it is God's spirit bearing witness with our spirit, that we are children and heirs of God. Eternal God, we pray for the world that through the reconciling love of Christ, our destructive and violent ways may cease as you bless your human family with peace. We pray for the mission of your church, that empowered by your spirit, we may proclaim the good news of the age and the world you so dearly love. We pray for all who suffer, that together with Christ and his suffering, we may find healing as he did, as he was raised and exalted in you. We pray for your creation, that as it groans for its redemption, we may care for its well-being through the power of your life-giving spirit. We remember before you those who have died and pray for those who will die today that through your glorious redemption that ends all suffering, they may rest with you eternally. Through Christ, with Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we praise you, O God, now and forever. Amen. And with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who gives life eternally. If you would please join me in our prayer of confession. Holy God, we know that you are always there to lead us, yet we somehow lose our way and fall back into fear. We confess that we have stumbled and we recognize our need for you to lift us up and help us start again. Forgive us our failings Restore us to strength and reconcile us with you, ourselves, and each other through the power of Christ and the gift of your spirit. Please take a few moments now for silent prayer and confession.
Beloved children of God, hear the good news. We did not receive the spirit of slavery, but rather the spirit of adoption. Your guilt has departed, your sin is blotted out, for you are God's beloved children, forgiven, loved, and free. May God's peace be with you. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning is from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. We'll now join in singing, We Believe in One True God. Our third scripture reading for this morning comes from the third chapter of John's Gospel, verses 1 through 17. This section is headed with the title, Nicodemus Visits Jesus. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. 
Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. If you'd please join me again in an attitude of prayer. Holy God of mystery, there is so much that we do not yet know and understand about you, your nature, and your plans. You are three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You create, you save, you breathe life into the world. You offer grace and mercy. You inspire and enlighten. You watch over your creation, call us to love, and connect us in our hearts through your everlasting love. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together in this place be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> no human has all the answers to the questions of faith and about God. There are several who think that they do, but the reality is that no human has all the answers to the questions of faith and about God, period. Jesus Christ is the only human, and he was also divine, let us not forget, to have all of the answers. Even as a pastor and someone who spent time studying scripture and theology, I cannot claim any special information or proof. We only have the one universal truth of God's love and grace that is shown through the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the salvation of the world. Which brings us to our focus for today, Trinity Sunday, the Holy Trinity God three in one. Such a simple concept, right? Why even spend much time discussing this? Well, just in case any part of this is not clear for anyone, today we're going to focus on the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at this idea and how we might be able to share it with someone who maybe has not yet come to faith in Jesus Christ. Today we're going to attempt to find an explanation of the Trinity that we can share with others while still holding on to the reality that we can only share what we believe and that everyone must come to their own beliefs for themselves. So where do we start? Scripture? Doctrine? Well, this morning we're going to be pulling from both of those sources as well as some others as appropriate. As United Methodists, we have a tradition using the Wesleyan, or Methodist, quadrilateral as a methodology for theological reflection for various topics and ideas, including the Holy Trinity. The quadrilateral uses four sources for this reflection and doctrinal development that includes scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. So, let's get started, shall we? According to Article 1 of the Articles of Religion of the Methodist Church titled, Of Faith in the Holy Trinity, 
There is but one living and true God, everlasting, without body or parts, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things, both visible and invisible. And in unity of this Godhead, there are three persons of one substance, power, and eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, our book of discipline also states in a section titled, Our Doctrinal Heritage, with Christians of other communions, we confess, believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This confession embraces the biblical witness to God's activity in creation, encompasses God's gracious self-involvement in the dramas of history, and anticipates the consummation of God's reign. So it seems, from a doctrine standpoint, there's not much to debate here. Both examples confirm our claimed belief in a triune God. But neither really gives any kind of breakdown to explain the idea of a triune God. So let's keep digging. How about in our traditions? Can we maybe find some help there about the Trinity? Let's look at the Apostles' Creed, an affirmation of faith we use in worship services uh, almost every week, or at least one of many creeds we use. There we find, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And then further on, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Hmm. We can also look to the Nicene Creed, one of the other creeds that we will use in worship service as an affirmation of faith. And there we find we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty. And then we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. And then further on, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Hmm. Well, these both offer a little bit more information about this whole Trinity thing. We believe in one God, so there is the one part of the three in one. The Father, the only Son of God, the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. And there we have the three parts of the three in one. But how can one thing be three things? The Nicene Creed uses the words begotten, not made, of one being, and proceeds from the Father and the Son. So the Nicene Creed seems to be making a point that it is not just three things we are claiming belief in, but that these three of God are also the one same God. Crystal clear, right? Well, so far we have looked at doctrine and tradition, Let's try reason next, shall we? As United Methodists, we claim a belief in the means of grace as outlined by John Wesley as provenient grace, justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. Provenient grace being God's active presence in our lives, independent of our action or response, and a gift that is always available, but also one that we can refuse. Justifying grace being the work of God in Jesus Christ through which sins are forgiven, our relationship with God is once again restored, and the image of God that was destroyed by sin is again renewed within each of us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and then our sanctifying grace being the ongoing experience of God's gracious presence that transforms us into whom God intends us to be, where we grow and mature in our ability to live our lives as Jesus lived. Wesley attributed, attributed pervenient grace to God the Father, justifying grace to Jesus Christ, and sanctifying grace to the Holy Spirit. 
His idea being that it is God the Father who is always active in our lives and offers that gift to us. That through Jesus Christ, we can experience justifying grace as our sins are forgiven, and that it is the Holy Spirit that continues to transform us and helps us to live our lives that they might mirror the life that Jesus lived. I would say that's good reason, especially when coupled with our traditions. So let's go on to scripture now. In our reading for today from John's Gospel, we find Jesus speaking with this Pharisee named Nicodemus. And in their discussion, we end up seeing part of the Trinity discussed. In verses 16 and 17, Jesus says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world or condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Okay, so two of the three are covered right there. How about the Holy Spirit? Well, if we go back to verses 5 through 8, we find Jesus talking and saying, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, it is not possible to enter God's kingdom. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be surprised that I said to you, you must be born anew. God's Spirit blows wherever it wishes. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. It is the same with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So there is evidence in Scripture, in reason, and in tradition regarding the Trinity and in our doctrine. How about experience? Well, I think one example that many pastors admit to or may claim to, myself included, includes the Holy Spirit regarding when we are preaching. My preaching professor in seminary warned our class that we will find ourselves in situations where we sit down, we craft a sermon, and maybe even feel really good about it, and we get all prepared, and then on Sunday morning, we come up to the pulpit to preach, and then the Holy Spirit taps us on the shoulder, and basically says, yeah, that's all great, you did good work here, but I need you to talk about this right now instead. And it's a really cool moment, and it's also incredibly terrifying. And I think our experience regarding God the Father and God the Son depend on our life experience and our journey to and through faith. I have known people who grew up without a father and then came to know God spoke about how God the Father helped to fill that void for them. I have also known people who speak about coming to know Jesus and feeling his presence changing them and feeling his presence during challenging and difficult situations. So I think we can check experience off our list too. So we found evidence of the Trinity in scripture, reason, tradition, and experience. We're all done, right? Everybody good? Well, we might have found the evidence, but did we explain it? Especially in terms that anyone will be able to understand and put together? Are the phrases begotten, not made, and proceeds from enough? Does anyone even use the word begotten? anymore except in worship services or when reading scripture. I can't say I remember the last time I heard it outside of that context. Now, I have heard of an example of a hard-boiled egg being used for children's messages, and I don't think that it is a bad analogy necessarily. It talks about how you have the yolk, the white, and then the shell. 
Each has its own identity and purpose, and yet all three make up something more. Take one away of the three parts, and you can argue that it is no longer an egg, although there are people who would argue it is. So it kind of works. But what other ways could we help explain this key doctrine of our faith? How about using names? Many people have three names, their first name, their middle name, and their last name. On their own, each of these names represents you. But on their own, none of the three names by themselves represents your whole name. All three names are needed to do that. The truth is, no matter what analogies or illustrations we might try to use in explaining the Trinity, they are all in one way or another coming up short. And I believe that is because of the mystery and greatness of God. None of them can really do God justice. Our ability to understand God is limited by our humanity. As humans, we may never fully understand everything about God, at least not in our time on this planet. And that's a reality that we must accept when we are sharing our faith with others and working to make disciples. We don't have all the answers. We don't know everything there is to know. We cannot really just hand someone else the perfect answer. But what we can do is share our faith and our understanding and then encourage others to do the work to do the same. We can encourage others to read scripture, to participate in tradition, to experience God through things like worship and prayer and to use their own reason to work through these challenging questions and ideas that we face sometimes. We must remember that there are literally countless possible answers and understandings when it comes to each person's faith. But there is only one universal truth, the love and grace of God that comes from the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The triune God, three in one, is the God we claim and believe in. I encourage you to go out and share this amazing mystery in all that you do, with all that you meet, and continue to work to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Amen. Our last him this morning is Maker in Whom We Live, number 88.
God said, Whom shall I send and who shall go for us? And Isaiah said, Here I am, send me. Life-giving God, free us from our fear, fill us with your love and send us forth in peace. May the Lord give strength to the people. May the Lord bless the people with peace. And the blessing of God who creates, redeems, and restores be with you now and always. Amen. Have a blessed week.